Dr. Sean Roden normally works for NASA, caring for astronauts before and during their missions, which he does from Houston Mission Control. But back in 2012, he had another gig as the doctor at the Edmondson Scott Station at the South Pole. And when he got there, they told him this story. They tell doctors this story because it is the most spectacular thing anyone has ever done in this kind of job. The story goes like this. In 1961, a Russian doctor got appendicitis at a Soviet Antarctic station. And so he needed emergency surgery to remove his appendix or he would probably die. And he was the one doctor there, snowed in during a blizzard. And so he had to figure out what to do. And so this Russian, a 27-year-old surgeon named Leonid Rogozov, removed his own appendix and lived. Could you perform this procedure on yourself? Oh, hell no. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'd rather die trying than give up. And so to try to understand just how difficult this would be, I turned to a surgeon and associate professor at the Harvard Medical School named Doug Smink, who hadn't heard this story, but he's written a lot about appendectomies for textbooks and medical journals, and he's performed the procedure. Probably two to three hundred times at least, maybe more. We have two accounts of this. There's a published report that the doctor wrote up in the Soviet Antarctic Expedition Information Bulletin. And we have the patient's diary. Are you calling him the patient or the surgeon? You could call him either one, right? In his account, he goes back and forth between those things. The symptoms noted were weakness, general malaise, later nausea. This is from his published account. Body temperature rose to 37 degrees centigrade, which is 99 Fahrenheit. And then he wrote in his diary, April 30th, 1961, I did not sleep at all last night. It hurts like the devil, a snowstorm whipping through my soul, wailing like a hundred jackals. Sounds like appendicitis. This is from the diary. An oppressive feeling of foreboding hangs over me. This is it. I have to think through the only possible way out to operate on myself. It's almost impossible, but I can't just fold my arms and give up. And then later that same day at 6.30 at night, the guys have found out. They keep coming by to calm me down. And I'm upset with myself. I've spoiled everyone's holiday. Tomorrow's May Day. And everybody's running around, preparing the autoclave. We have to sterilize the bedding because we're going to operate. And then he explains which person is going to do what. A meteorologist is going to hold retractors. A driver is going to hold a mirror. And then, just in case one of those two guys who's never witnessed an operation passes out, another guy was on standby to jump in. (laughs) In the event that the patient lost consciousness, they were instructed to inject the drugs in the syringes that I had prepared and to administer artificial respiration. He writes, the position of the patient at operation was designed to make it possible for him to perform the operation with minimal use of the mirror. And to do that, basically, they prop him up on his back. He's leaning on one hip. Well, I'm just looking down at my own abdomen. I know where I would make an incision, but to then see deeper down in the layers would be a challenge. I'm sure that's where the mirror came in. It probably was also just really uncomfortable to sit in that position for two hours and try to work. I can only imagine. From the diary, my poor assistants. At the last minute, I looked over at them. They stood there in their surgical whites, whiter than white themselves. I was scared too. When I picked up the needle with the Novocaine and gave myself the first injection, Somehow I automatically switched into operating mode. And from that point on, I didn't notice anything else. That's amazing. Almost like an out-of-body experience, it sounds like he had. I worked without gloves. It was hard to see. The mirror helps, but it also hinders. After all, it's showing things backwards. I work mainly by touch. The bleeding is quite heavy, but I take my time. I try to work surely. The other thing to remember in this is that not only is he just operating on himself, but he's quite ill. You know, patients who have appendicitis don't feel like doing anything. They just want to curl up in bed and hope somebody will make them better. So to actually have to function and think clearly, both function physically and mentally, is amazing. It's just amazing. In fact, Rogozov spends most of the two-hour operation fighting off unconsciousness. After just 30 or 40 minutes, he started to experience vertigo. Every four or five minutes, he had to stop and rest. Dr. Smink explained to me that what happens in an appendectomy is you cut through the skin, then through a layer of fat, then three layers of muscle, then a layer of something called fascia, and then finally there's the peritoneum. I describe it like a clear balloon. It's about that thin. Inside the balloon are the intestines, and you kind of poke around the intestines with your fingers to find the appendix. The appendix is about the size of your pinky. And so he's having to move his own intestines out of the way 
to find the appendix. Exactly. By feel, which is actually how we do it often in an open appendectomy. So he would have had experience with that. You basically feel around and you can feel like a firm sausage or something. And that is the appendix. But before Rogozov locates the appendix, he realizes that he accidentally tore into a part of the large intestine called the cecum. He has to sew it up. He wrote in his diary, suddenly it flashed in my mind, there are more injuries here and I didn't notice them. I grow weaker and weaker. My head starts to spin. Finally, here it is. The cursed appendage. With horror, I noticed the dark stain at its base. That means just a day longer and it would have burst. Rogozov doesn't write what is obvious to him, that a burst appendix, he probably would have died. I think he would have. Rogozov writes, At the worst moment of removing the appendix, I flagged. My heart seized up and noticeably slowed. My hands felt like rubber. Well, I thought, it's going to end badly. Dr. Smink explained to me, in order to cut the appendix out, Rogozov would have pulled it out of his body with the stuff that it's attached to through the four-inch hole in his belly, and then he would have cut it off, which, of course, he did successfully. Fully recovered in two weeks, and then back on the job. There are so many parts that are impressive to me. Probably most impressive, the mental aspect of this. He obviously had the perfect personality to pull this off, and then to have the courage but also the wherewithal to assemble a team and explain to them what they were going to do while he had appendicitis. Like, that's the thing. When I read this, I can't tell, could most surgeons do this? I think many people would be really uncomfortable doing it on themselves or would not be able to remain composed uh, while also the patient. Could you do this? I, you know, I don't know. I think you would never know until you were put in that situation. I'd like to think I could, if, if given no other option. Of course, we all would like to believe that we would measure up if we were tested like this at something. 